Um, we had some we had some miracles today. Today was miracle day. I mean that. I I believe in God. I have a God. Amen. I have a God that when I am in sorrow, when I am struggling, when I'm hurting, when I um, and getting pounded by Satan, when I've done wrong, I have a God that I go to and I tell him what my problems are. I tell him where my bitterness is because we always kind of find bitterness in places in life. And I tell God all of that. I have a God that I can talk to. I don't have very many earthly friends. Um, you know, in the ministry, you can have friends, but you can't let that friendship get in the way of what you have to say to people. Sometimes it does. But I have a God that I can go to, and I tell Him all my problems, and I tell Him what I'm concerned about, what I'm worried about, what I'm bitter about, what I did. And God, God always is there hearing me. He always is. Never does he leave me. He has never left me. He's never forsaken me. He's always been there. And even though at times I think, okay, I prayed, but where's the answer to the prayer? Uh, God's got eternity. He can answer it anytime he wants. He's not in a hurry. But I guarantee you, when he does answer the prayer, it will be at the exact time that it needs to be done. So we sent Michael to Kenya, and we sent him with about two or three suitcases full of children's toys that we bought. And um, his plan, you know, when you go into a foreign country and you've got suitcases full of merchandise, they tend to want to know what that is. And our experience working in third world nations is that sometimes the shilling talks better than anybody does. And so rather than being held up at the airport with a very large import tax on merchandise, a guy's taking his wife out to a nice dinner. Okay? That's how it's done. But we bought as many toys as we could get for the children out there. And I think probably they may have said that on the radio because over 1,400 children showed up. And we didn't have enough toys. But we had enough food. 1,680 families were fed for a week today. 11 people were saved. 11 elders, that means old people, were saved. We'll, we'll get to see them in heaven. They're going to listen to our radios. They're going to listen to our church services now. Amen? And um, it's funny because our idea in starting these radio stations was not God's plan in starting them because God's taken over okay so plan a went out the window a long time ago and God's plan um, Omega the Omega plan because it's the last one it's working smoothly and uh, so we're excited about that and then my daughter Lindsay um, she was hurting real bad, like right in her abdomen. And I mean, just in pain. I was editing the Sunday evening service today and I started playing the video to find the edit points and I see Lindsay walking to the sanctuary doubled over like this. And I'm going, she was in severe pain. I took her to the ER uh, Monday and they did a CT scan and they said she's got a blockage in her, in her bowels. And I mean, it was packed tight, nothing moving, nothing coming out, nothing going anywhere. And they put her on the schedule today at one o'clock to operate on that, to cut out that part of the bowel 
stitch it together. And um, they decided to do one x-ray today and the blockage was gone. Amen. So, and there are some other things that God did today, and I'm just, I'm pleased about it. I'm happy. Yes, Roy! Well, Monday night, down at Walmart, Charles Kim, the checkout thing, the checkout. And there was a, a, a guy with a ponytail, you know, the He turned around, he paid. My grocery bill. Oh, don't judge a book by its cover. Amen. How many tattoos did he have? Or how much skin did his tattoos have? Oh, okay. God is still on the throne and prayer changes things. That's what my old friend Noah Hutchings used to say. Amen. Second Peter chapter one. Um, let's. You, you know, I, I was going to do this um, this afternoon, and John came in my office and got me talking, and I wouldn't shut up. Uh, but you know what? I'm, I'm redeeming myself right here. Turn to Psalm 119 very quickly. Very quickly. I'll give you eight seconds. That's how long bull riders are supposed to ride a bull. So if you can get there in eight seconds, but you've got to use one hand, because bull riders only get to use one hand, right? <laughs> Amen. So, this is the verse I had in mind. I just knew. Because what I'm going to teach you tonight is about the Word of God and how it works. And the Word of God is not really for your flesh. Okay? There's a law of sin that, is, that rules over your flesh that basically has already condemned your flesh. Your flesh, your body is on death row. Waiting to be executed because you've all the flesh has already sinned the sins and this is something and I'm I'm working with a guy right now I'm, I'm kind of counseling by email because he's having a hard time understanding You know the nature of a Christian Who's got an issue with sin and he does and I'm I'm trying to show him Romans 7 that there's two me's Standing here. The outer man is this flesh body that you see that's not in good shape. And it's getting corrupt more and more and more. It's on its way out. Because the condemnation of sin is on this outer man. But my inner man is not only not corrupt, it's not corruptible. It is, the Bible says it is renewed day by day. Every day, this new man is still new. Every day. That new man, 1 John says, doesn't sin. Never has sinned and never will sin. Okay? That's what Romans 7 means. That's what 1 John means. That's what the Bible's telling you. That you have two parts to your Bible. Old and New Testament. The Old Testament basically shows you all the sins that you did. The New Testament says, we're going to leave the flesh behind. Somebody say amen to that. Because it stinks. You smell. You are a corruption manufacturing machine. Right? Everything your body produces stinks. So it's corrupt. But the new man on the inside of you is what is the righteous part of you. And so look at, and it, and it takes the word of God to do this. As I feed my outer man to keep it going, I also feed the inner man. But not with deer sausage, Brother George. Not with popcorn and candy and soda pop and hamburgers. But with this book. Look at Psalm 119 verse 25. My soul cleaveth unto the dust. Quicken thou me according to thy word. The word quicken means made alive. To do something quickly doesn't necessarily mean to do it in a fast manner, but it means to do it like you've got some life to you. Have you ever seen, get this now, have you ever seen workers working like this?
Here's your cheeseburgers. Have a nice day. Okay? Or, here's your cheeseburgers. Have a nice day. Thank you. Please come back. Which would you rather have? See, that person did it quickly. They did it like they have some life in them and like they want to be the manager one day. Ambition, right? So that's your soul. Your soul cleaveth unto the dust, but quicken thou me according to thy word. I have declared my ways, and thou heardest me. Teach me thy statutes. Make me to understand the way of thy precepts. So shall I talk of thy wondrous works. My soul, verse 28. Here it again. It's talking about your soul again. My soul melteth for heaviness. Strengthen thou me according unto thy word. There he says it again. Quicken me in verse 25. Strengthen me in um, verse 28. Verse 29. Remove me. Remove from me the way of lying and grant me thy law graciously. Verse 30, I have chosen the way of truth. Thy judgments have I laid before me. I have stuck unto thy testimonies. O Lord, put me not to shame. I will run the way of thy commandments when thou shalt enlarge my heart. And if you read Psalm 119, you'll get, a, you'll get your batteries charged up on the word of God because practically every verse in Psalm 119, deals somehow, some way with God's statutes, his judgments, his laws, his precepts, his word. And that's what we're studying. So 2 Peter, again, chapter 1, verse 15, I have it on the screen. Moreover, let me check my, uh, see what uh, is going on with the sound. How are we doing so far? I can't get my, my wife says, your mouth and the words are not synced. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Seems to be good. All right. Well, we'll, we'll see. All right. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 15. Moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. I talked about that last week. This is the reason why we write our will down. Write your last will and testament down. Don't just leave it up. Don't just vocalize it because somebody after you die is going to lie about you. Write it down. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty, for he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And I believe Peter. If Peter would come in this church today and he told me that, I would believe the man. But he's not here. And he won't, he won't be here. He's in heaven already. So... What do we have? We have the words that Peter both heard and spake, and we have them written down for us and preserved for us. And if you ever want to know what I believe and why I believe what I believe about this Bible, I got a pastor friend. Uh, in fact, it's uh, Pastor Jason Hutzel, Brother Mike Hutzel's son. He is uh, working on some kind of research for a class he's taking. And he's going to try to prove why he believes the King James Bible. And I, he shared something with me and I told him, I said, that is exactly right. He, he was talking about how Moses put the pot of manna inside the Ark of the Covenant. Now, when God let manna fall down from heaven and they went out and gathered it every day, what happened to the remnant that was left outside? Did manna just keep piling up every day? It, it rotted away. What happened when they gathered too much that they didn't eat? It spoiled bread, worms, and stank, the Bible says. Okay? But when Moses took that pot of manna and put it in the Ark of the Covenant, it was preserved in there, wasn't it? It didn't corrupt. It didn't rot. When they laid Jesus' body in the tomb... When they came back on the third day, what were they expecting? A very smelly, dead, rotting carcass. But the Bible says that God would not allow his Holy One to see corruption. His body laid in that tomb for two days on the third day and did not corrupt one bit. So I believe this is the word of God and I believe that God has not allowed this book to be corrupted. I believe that with all my heart. So, and that, and we're, this is what I'm going to set about to show you. So, in verse 19, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto you do well that you take heed as into a light that shineth in a dark place. 
until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Let's pray. Father, we ask your blessings upon um, our study tonight. I pray, God, that you would lead my mind. And Father, I thank you. Thank you for miracles. And I pray, dear God, that you would bless those beautiful people out in Kenya. Beautiful people. Beautifully adorned. Those children receiving toys like children should. And them getting food and those elders being saved. And Father, for my daughter, for blessing her the way you did. Father, I thank you, Lord, for numerous blessings that you've blessed us with today. Lord, I love you. I thank you, God. Father, I pray for Michael tonight. And Lord God, I know the devil's getting after him for what he did. And that's going to happen. I pray, dear God, that you would send a sweet spirit to him and relieve him, dear God. Give him joy for the work that he's put into it. Father, we just pray, dear God, that you give us joy tonight as we open up your word and learn what it means to us and learn what it does for us. Give us light, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. Now, um, I, I, here's what I want to do. I took, if, you've, if you don't do this and have never done this, we had a lady write software for our ministry, Pure Bible Search software and all it does is search the bible search the king james bible and it does it very very well so what i did all i did for tonight was look at verses that said the word of god the word of god okay or word of god 49 times in your bible that is seven times seven that's perfection multiplied by perfection this means that Bible's right in everything that it says. So you just take that, and this is how I this is how I read the Bible. I don't often just read chapter to chapter to chapter. I usually use the software and take words or phrases and read them all through the scriptures. I'll click on one and look at the context of a particular passage or phrase and find out what's what's in the neighborhood, what else was said that goes along with that. Thing to do. Paul said, walk circumspectly. It means circum is a circle. Spectacles is what we have. And we walk looking around. And that's not only to see the danger around you, to see where you're going, which means you can't walk and be on your cell phone. Right? They were talking on the news the other day about cell phone injuries and people getting their head broke because they were on their phone like this and bang and crushed your head open anyway where's it going with that anyway walk, walk look at a passage and then read the context of that passage see what verses come before it read those verses what verses come after it and read those verses so that you don't misunderstand what the bible is saying in that particular phrase one of the tricks that the devil does and his prophets is they'd like to isolate a verse or a part of a verse, take it out of the context to where it they can make it say then what they want it to say. But when you go and look at the context of that verse, you're going, it doesn't say that at all. And that's what I mean by that. All right, Ephesians 6, you can follow with me because I may talk fast tonight, but I'm going to go through these. Ephesians 6, verse 17, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is... The Word of God. So number one, the Bible, the Word of God, is our spiritual weapon. And if you look at that list in Ephesians 6, of all the things that you know Paul says to take, because we're, we're going to have to stand against the wiles of the devil, and he's throwing fiery darts at us to try to kill us. He's trying to destroy us. Those fiery darts could, could be sin that the devil's trying to get you with, or those fiery darts could be false doctrine that he's trying to get you under because he would love to get you in bondage to some false prophet somewhere so that you are a servant to a beast and set a servant to God. So the only way to defend ourselves is we must have a shield of faith, a helmet of salvation, uh, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, our loins girt about with truth, have a breastplate of righteousness, and those are all defensive. Those are all to keep the enemy from striking our body. Our offensive weapon is our sword. That's what we use to go after the devil. When you get, listen to me, 
When you get tired of the devil beating on you, you'll stand up and say, I've had enough. Amen? I've done that before. I've I literally stood up and said, I've had enough, devil. Now you get out of my life and you get out of my family and you get out of my church. I've had enough of you. And that's when you take the sword, which is the word of God. What did Jesus use on the devil when the devil was tempting Jesus? He pulled his sword out. What is, what is Jesus, how is Jesus going to defeat the Antichrist? With the spirit of his mouth, which if you look in Revelation 19, there's a sword coming out of his mouth, a sharp two-edged sword, and his name is the word of God. So it's our spiritual weapon. Number two, it's our food. Luke chapter four, verse four. This is the parable of the seed, or not, this is not the parable of the seed and the sower. But Jesus said, answered him saying, it is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Now, I want you to open your Bible to Luke 4, 4. I want you to open your Bible and I want you to take a pen and I want you to underline the word every. Every. What we're going to learn as we go through this study on the word of God, because I think this is important. It's important to know who God is. And it's important to know who Jesus is. And it's important to know who the Holy Ghost is. But the only way that the only way that we can know who they really, really are is that if we believe every word of God. And if you don't believe every word of God, you're going to invent a God that does not match the God that is in this Bible. It's like having a lottery ticket where every number on there is just one number short of the winning ticket. You understand what I'm saying? There's six numbers on there and every number that you have is one less than the winning ticket. So do you have a winning ticket? No. You have a you have the you are the first loser. You are the first person to not get $350 million. So when he said, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word of God, is it possible to live if we believe what the scholars tell us that we don't have every word of God? So let me ask you this. Do you believe that in this Bible we have Every word of God. What about the word but in that verse? Did, did God say that word? Did God say it in that verse? In Exodus 20, when it starts out the Ten Commandments, it says, and God spake all these words saying. And the Holy Ghost, I was reading that one day and the Holy Ghost stopped me and said, Mike, read that verse. God spake all these words saying. Do you believe that? And I understood what the Holy Ghost was getting at. Do I believe what I'm reading? Those exact words in English are the words that God wants me to know came directly from him. Thou should not have no other gods before me. Thou should make any. Those words came directly from God himself. They were delivered down here to man, translated perfectly. Perfectly is what I believe. So, can man live, and this is the question, can a person be saved if they don't believe part of the Bible? Think about that for a minute. If they don't believe, and it's like this, because there was a time in my life we'll call it the gap that I wasn't believing that the King James was perfect. Okay. There was a time when I didn't believe what I'm telling you tonight and I didn't think I would ever believe it, but God knew that I was, didn't he? So when God brought me out of that and brought me to his marvelous light, I mean, I don't think, you know, maybe somebody could have, and I had, I have friends now who during that time, they didn't like me. And they judged me as being pretty close to an infidel. I 
wasn't done with me. And he brought me to a place where I now, I'm like Paul. I was on my way to kill the believers. And now I'm one of them. You crazy King James only people. Okay? So the question is, does a person have to believe that God created the world in six days, literal days? Does the person have to believe that the flood covered the highest mountain 15 cubits upward? Does a person have to believe that God really did part the Red Sea and the Israelites walked across on dry ground? Does a person really have to believe that an angel came down at the pool of Siloam and stirred up the water and whoever went in first was healed? Does a person have to believe that? Does it... Does a person have to believe um, that the, the, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one? These are important questions. Because maybe you, and I know the, the group of people online, they know people who go to church who do not believe the King James. I talked to a guy today, and he said his wife doesn't, doesn't buy into it. Is pray for my wife, and I prayed. Now, like I say, God can change anyone's heart, and he did mine. But is a person saved if the seed is corrupt? Because Jesus said... Corrupt seed brings forth what? Corrupt fruit. Incorrupt seed brings forth incorrupt fruit. And an incorrupt seed cannot bring forth corruptible fruit. And vice versa. So again, you know, the verse comes into mind, judge no man before the time. So I'm not saying this to cast judgment on people or on individual people. But as a rule, do you think that we get to pick and choose which parts of the Bible believe and which parts we don't? The way I understand the scripture With God, it's all or nothing. And let me show you an example. Let me show you from Scripture why I believe what I believe. Turn to Deuteronomy 18. Deuteronomy 18. Now, look at verse 20. Bye, Ron. Take care of that foot, all right? All right. Love you, buddy. Look at, in fact, let's back up. Look at verse 19. God said in verse 18, he's going to send them the prophet, capital P, that's Jesus. In verse 19, it says, And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. Now read that verse again. To hearken is to believe. Did Noah believe God? What he said. Did Noah believe that God was going to destroy the entire earth? Did Noah believe that? Did Noah hearken to what God said? Yes, he did. He did. And he lived because of it. And you and I are here because Noah hearkened to what God said. So God says, when I send that prophet, Whosoever will not hearken unto my words. Those are God's words through. And he was talking about his own son. But he said, they're my words. So verse 20. But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name. Which I have not commanded him to speak. Or that shall speak in the name of other gods. Even that prophet shall die. And if thou say in thine heart. How shall we know the word which the Lord hath not Spoken, like the book of Maccabees, or the book of Enoch, or the gospel according to Peter, which Peter didn't write a gospel, 
Or this, this is my favorite one. The gospel according to Judas Iscariot. That's my favorite one. They found one copy of that buried in a jar in the middle of the desert. How they found it, I have no idea. But it allegedly was written by Judas Iscariot. And the story goes that Jesus, you're going to like this one. Jesus and Judas were going to play good cop, bad cop. Jesus said, I'll be, I want to be the good cop. Judas, will you be the bad cop? Will you come against me publicly? And if you do, if you play along, I'll give you secret doctrines that I'm not telling the other disciples. That's what he wrote in there. But Judas didn't write it. Judas didn't write a gospel. And he definitely, that's not the gospel of God. So how can we know? How can we know? Now, verse 22 to me is absolute pivotal. When a prophet, and when you're talking about, when we just read in 1 Peter, this is the sure word of prophecy. So the book that you're holding in your hand is the prophet of God. When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken, but the prophet has spoken it presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him. God is saying this. If a man prophesies, and it didn't come to pass. He says, tomorrow at noon, God's going to send fire down from heaven. So at 12.01, the guy's a liar. But at 12.05, people start going, doesn't look like he's showing up. At 15 after, at 12.30, by 1 o'clock, everybody's going, this guy's a liar. Do you know what God said about that man in that verse? You don't have to believe one thing he said, ever, 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 ever. Because if he's wrong one time, you never have to listen to him. So, I'm going to give you a name. Isaiah. You don't have to turn there. But the prophet Isaiah, there are 66 chapters of what he said God said. Can Isaiah have one thing wrong in the whole book of Isaiah? It's not possible. Not possible. Because if Isaiah is wrong one time in any of these 66 chapters, God has already said you don't listen to Isaiah. Because God's standard is higher than ours, is it not? Can God let you in heaven with one sin? See what I mean? What if it's a teeny tiny, very small, innocent mistake that you made that you didn't mean to do it? God doesn't care. He set a standard that you must be perfect. And God's standard of perfection and God's standard of purity and God's standard of excellence and God's standard of everything is as high as you can get. And you cannot be wrong and be a prophet of God. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So let's go back to this question because this is interesting and it's, it has serious repercussions. Man cannot live, shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. So if they take, Brother George, the Greek text, the Novum, Gratium Novum Testamentum, the Greek New Testament, and it's now in its 28th revision. And so at some point, they're going to bring it out the 29th revision, which means that they have changed words in the Greek text. To what? I don't know. From what? I don't know. But they've altered the text 28 different times. Does that sound like a sure word of prophecy to you? No, it doesn't. They're saying that we corrected the Bible 28 times. That, that so far, it's had, even if they change one word, then what they're saying is, so far, we've corrected 28 errors in the Bible. And we expect that there's going to be more. They don't believe the same thing that you and I believe, or that I believe. They don't believe that. So, again, I'm not anybody's judge. I can't look at some preacher across town and say he's not going to heaven because he don't believe the King James. And I can't do that because God may not be done with that guy yet. 
like he wasn't done with me. Thank God he brought me out. But God, this is serious business. Serious business. Uh, the next verse I have, John 10, 35, the God is unbreakable. So John 10, 35, if he called them gods unto whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken. The scripture, now he's, he says the word of God is the scripture. It says it in that verse. If he called them gods unto whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken. So we know then that the scripture is the word of God. It says it in that verse. They're talking about the same thing. So again, I get back to this statement. Can the Bible be wrong one time? No, it's in, it's unbreakable. It's unbreakable, like the bones of Jesus on the cross. Amen? Did they break any of Jesus' bones? No, not a bone of him was broken. That was the prophecy. And if that prophecy didn't come to pass, the devil owns this earth. Because God's a liar. And God is not a liar. So, when he says every word of God, then the very next place is telling you the scripture cannot be broken. And then 1 Peter 1.23, now we find out that it's incorruptible. It's unbreakable. It's incorruptible, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And then in Proverbs 30, verse 5, we find out that it's pure. Every word of God is pure. He's a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Um, I'm not going to get, I'm not going to say this, but do you all remember the test? In the Old Testament law, there was a way that they tested a woman's virginity, Right? There's a way they tested that. And the husband had a right to show the proof of his wife, his brand new wife's virginity. And if there's only one test, and if it was found out she wasn't pure, he could put her out. He could flat put her out according to the law. Okay? In God's eyes, pure is pure. Which means absolutely no defilement whatsoever. There's not anything in this Bible that shouldn't be. I uh, preached this at, at a revival down in southern Missouri to a church. And I had a man jump me after the service because I said the word King and James in the same sentence. And he climbed all over me. And I said, brother, I tell you what, won't you come tomorrow night then? Because I'm going to preach on this. I hadn't planned to, but since he jumped me, I'm, I'm going to go, I'm going to preach on it. So the next night I did. And I gave out my proof why I believe the Bible is pure. And when I got done, you know what? He had not changed his mind one bit. He jumped me again. And I said, well, let me ask you something. I said, do you believe that this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting? And he put his finger at me. He said, that was added by the King James translators. That should have never been in the Bible. I said, well, I know who you are now. And I gave, I pulled back. I said, I'm not going to get into debate with you. I already know who you are. You have already decided in your mind that your mind is an authority over the Bible. You've decided that the Bible is wrong. It's had something added to it. And I say the Bible you've got has got way too much taken out of it. 64,000 less words in an NIV than the King James. So what does that... I mean, we're not just talking about three words difference. We're talking 64,000 words that are missing out of the NIV when you compare it to the King James. Is that a substantial amount to you? If I gave you a dollar for every difference, you would have $64,000. I would be broke. So the Bible is unbreakable, it's incorruptible, and it's pure. Every word of God is pure. How many words of God are pure? Every word of God is pure. Uh, who in here has a Thompson Chain Reference Bible? Anybody? Thompson Chain Reference Bible. Turn to... Um, Turn to, um, 
Now I've stuck my foot in my mouth. I've got to remember where this verse is. Um, oh, 2 Timothy 3.16. 2 Timothy 3.16. Turn there. If you have a Tom, Thompson Chain Reference Bible, those of you watching online, if you have a Thompson Chain Reference, look this up. Because I've got one. Somebody called me today wanting to know what kind of Bible I would recommend. He's going to get a Bible for his wife. And he says, you know, I've heard you talk. He said, I know you're not big on common, commentary Bibles. And I asked the man, I said, that's right. I said, who in the world right now do you trust? He said, nobody. I said, what I would encourage you to do is get a, a reference Bible. That way, when you're reading the Bible, you're doing what the Bible says. You're, you're going to find out, you look at a verse and it's got verses there in the middle bar that tells you other verses that you can look up that coincide with that verse. And I said, it's here a little, there a little. It's the Holy Ghost comparing spiritual things with spiritual things the way it's supposed to be. Let, the, let God be the commentary of the Bible. Let the Bible comment on the Bible. And so, in the Thompson Chain reference, 2 Timothy 3, 6, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. What does that mean? All Scripture. Does it, does it exclude one word? No, it means all. All means all. Are you like Bill Clinton? You don't know what the word is, is. Amen. It's all scripture. You know what the Thompson chain reference says in the bar there, in the little, little middle bar? It says RV, revised version, and it gives an alternative rendering of that verse. Every inspired scripture has its use. Is that the same phrase? Is that the same statement? That is not the same phrase. It's not the same thing. What it's saying is, not all scripture is inspired, but the ones that is, you can use it. My question is, who decides which is inspired and which is not? The United Methodist Church, way back in the 80s, decided to publish a copy of the Gospels New Testament, and their esteemed scholars categorized the, sa the statements of Jesus. And they had different categories. Category A was Jesus probably actually said these words. Category B was Jesus probably might not have said these words. Category C was no way, no how did Jesus say these words. And they took every word in a red letter edition four Gospels, and they categorized the words of Jesus in one of those three categories. Who gave them the right to do that? Which is why you see the United Methodist Church in the spiritual condition that it's in. Because they didn't believe what Jesus said. Amen? It is unstoppable. Acts 12, 24. But the Word of God grew and multiplied. You can't stop the word of God. Can't stop it. If God sent forth his word. When God said let there be light. Was there resistance? Was there a war? It happened. And where did the light come from? There was no sun. There was no moon. And there were no stars. Where did the light come from? It doesn't say, but it was there. And God divided the light from darkness. The word of God. You cannot stop the word of God. It is, however, rejectable. Look at Acts chapter 13, verse 46. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. This was the turning point with the Apostle Paul. Acts chapter 13 is when Saul became Paul. And when Saul became Paul, he preached his last message to the Jewish synagogues. He said, I'm done. Because the word of God can be rejected. Now, let's bring this up. Since they were Jews, they accepted the Old Testament, didn't they? But they didn't accept what Paul was preaching, the new covenant. Because of that, they chose, they chose part of God's word, but they didn't want all of God's word. They rejected it. 
It's mighty and ever prevailing. Acts chapter 19 verse 20. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. That goes along with unstoppable. The word of God is mighty. The word of God prevails. And it prevails every single time. Everything that every, every battle you fought spiritually, every war that you got in, every victory that you've gained has been a result of the Word of God working in you. Those 11 people out there in Kenya were preached to today. They were on their knees getting saved. I got the pictures. On their knees, Brother George. Asking Jesus into their heart. These people are, were pagans. They were heathen. They had fetishes. They had witch doctors. They did witchcraft. And now they're saved. Because the word of God prevailed in their life. This is why the Catholic priests don't like us. The Seventh-day Adventists don't like us. And a bunch of other people. And the Dr. Owar followers, the false prophet followers in Kenya don't like us. I'm surprised they don't come over here. The Bible is the soul. Look at this. Ro turn to Romans 10, 17. And I'm going I'm to wind it down here. Romans 10, 17. The Bible is the soul source of faith. What does that word soul mean? Only. Only. Not Chuck Swindoll. Not Joyce Myers. Not books at the Christian bookstore. Not music on Joy FM. That's not where you get... YouTube is not where you get your doctrine from. Facebook memes are not where you get your doctrine from. You get your faith only from the Word of God. This was what separated the early Protestant or uh, Puritan believers from... The church of Rome was that they believed in sola scriptura. Only the scriptures is what we don't believe the Pope. We don't believe the line of popes. We don't believe the line of papal bull. We don't believe any of that. That's nonsense. We believe only the word of God. Amen. It's effectual. It's our sanctification. It's unbound. It is alive. It abideth in you. It has creative power. Man, I, it's worth dying for. I got that coming up next Wednesday. That Bible's worth dying for. Your forefathers in the faith were nailed, stripped naked, tied to a post, and lit on fire. Because they believed the Bible. And you couldn't talk them out of it. I would really, God, I would really not like to be burnt. I just... Why does death have to hurt? So I'm a big chicken. I'm a man, right? We can... Form armies and conquer the world, but you come at us with a needle and we'll pass out and faint. I don't necessarily want to be tortured to death. But I'm not going to stop believing my Bible. I'd rather die than to have the word of God taken away. I'd rather die. Amen? Now I've prepared some cool.